Today we read the beginning of Ephesians, and it seems fitting that as we come back together after this long 16 months, that we begin by reading a letter that was intended to offer encouragement to God's church. So this letter, written either by Paul or someone using Paul's name and writing in Paul's style, this letter, it still offers encouragement to God's church in the world today. So let us turn our hearts and minds to God as we open up God's word and let us pray. Startle us, O God, with your truth this day. As we come here today looking for so many different things, we come here looking for you. And as we look, we pray that you would find us through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So listen now for a feed into Ephesians 1, verses 1 to 14. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, just as he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before him in love. He destined us for adoption as his children through Jesus Christ, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace that he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and insight, he has made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure that he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time, to gather up all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In Christ, we have also obtained an inheritance having been destined according to the purpose of him who accomplishes all things according to his counsel and will so that we who were the first to set our hope on Christ might live for the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and had believed in him, were marked with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit. This is the pledge of our inheritance toward redemption as God's own people, to the praise of his glory. This is the word of the Lord. When my friend Ben was diagnosed with stage four lung cancer in 2017, he went through tests and scans, and biopsies, and a long period of waiting for his doctor decided to start him on a targeted drug therapy. The drug was something he could take at home. He just needed to go pick it up at the pharmacy at the cancer center. So he went on a Tuesday and stood in line behind people who could have been buying cough medicine or deodorant or something else, very normal. When it was his turn, Ben gave his name, and he was handed a small paper bag with a bottle of pills inside. It was wild, he remembers, being given such a life-saving container in such a nonchalant way. When they finished ringing up the medicine, the clerk looked at Ben and said, as they do at the pharmacy every time, do you have any more questions? And there was a brief pause before Ben said, yes. And then he held out his small paper bag. He said, will you bless this for me? 
And the split second look on the clerk's face said three things. One, no one has ever asked me to do this before. Two, why not? And then three, I have absolutely no idea what to do or say to bless a bottle of pills. So the clerk paused for a beat as she tried to process what to do in this moment before she offered a beautiful, polite bow toward the medicine. And as she finished her bow, she threw in a hand flourish for good measure. It was so sweet, so dear, this impromptu blessing. Perfect, Ben said, thank you. And he left the pharmacy with his bag of medicine. I think blessings are hard things to wrap our minds around. They are like prayers, and yet they're different somehow. They can feel awkward to offer to someone. They can feel vulnerable to receive. Blessings are hard to define, and we don't practice them with regularity. Curses, on the other hand, those you can find just about everywhere. Curses are those negative, judgmental sentiments spoken, most of which I can't say examples out loud of today because so many of our expressions have words that would need to be bleeped. We say them in moments of road rage. We yell them to a ref who makes a bad call. We utter them in the comfort of our own homes to politicians and pundits who cannot hear us. At times, we say them to people we love. At times, we say them to ourselves. I hear people do this to themselves, often wondering if they are repeating words that they heard from someone else spoken to them. Everything from, I'm not smart, to it's hard to love me, to I can't succeed. Blessings don't come as naturally as cursing. And maybe that's because we don't practice blessings. Or maybe because it's that we don't know what it is exactly. On occasion, we have special moments of blessing here at church. In the fall, we have a back-to-school blessing of the backpacks where we literally hold our hands out toward the children and their backpacks, and we say something like, as you carry this backpack to school this year, may you feel the love of God and the love of community surrounding you. We bless someone at their baptism. We bless confirmation students. We may offer a blessing to students as they graduate high school. Every week, Pastors around the world offer a blessing at the end of a worship service. We call it the benediction. A blessing isn't any one thing. The words of blessing, they are part prayer and part reminder. They are part longing and part mystery. These are words that demand nothing from us and they take nothing from us, yet they are words with power. Blessings have been understood throughout Scripture to bind us to our precious past and to a promised future. To re receive a blessing only requires an openness to hearing. The letter of Ephesians is written to a church community that was in need of a blessing. And in this letter, that is what they get. Blessing upon blessing as if one blessing wasn't enough to sink in. Blessing upon blessing because that is the kind of flowing grace that reflects the love of God. But before offering a blessing for the community, the writer takes a moment to bless God, to bless the one from whom all blessings flow, to bless God, the creator and redeemer of all things, God who has everything to give and lacks nothing. 
And on some level, this is an audacious act, which is precisely the point. Too often, we look at blessing as a performa act or a simple saying. God bless you. Bless your heart. Or we use it as a signature sign-off on an email. We don't think of it as potent. But our lives are filled with hopes and hurts, with dreams and dreads. Blessing God is a way to channel all of that. Blessing God opens us to the relationship that can hold all of our prayers and our longings and our important memories and reminders and all the amazement in the mystery. Blessing God frees us to bless others and be blessed by others. And that's what the writer does next. It goes from blessing God to offer blessings for this community and the people here, either again or for the first time, that God blesses them. Not just that day, but from the beginning of time. They hear that they have been loved and cared for since the foundation of the world. They hear that God's blessings for them do not end. The writer gives specific blessings, telling them that God loves them, has adopted them as God's own children, that they are forgiven, that they are filled with wisdom and insight, that they are drawn into a part of a larger community to live for God's glory. These blessings are a vision of God's kingdom in the world offered to this church when they are struggling. This church, desperate to see the justice and hope and peace Jesus talked about, but despite their prayers and their efforts and their service, their world did not yet look like the kingdom of God. Despite all of their work, people were still hungry and scared and in pain. This group was looking to see Jesus, and they were struggling to encourage them. Paul offers a blessing, part prayer, part reminder, part longing, part mystery, a reminder of God's intention for the world. A week ago Thursday, a restaurant in Cape Cod shut its doors unexpectedly so that the owners could give its staff a day of kindness. The decision was made after the staff had endured weeks of unusual verbal abuse from customers, all since fully reopening. The staff, mostly young, had endured being berated and cussed at and threatened lawsuits for things like not being given the best table. So many of the staff had ended their shifts in tears or had to take breaks just to gather their own breath. The owners couldn't take it anymore. When the outlandish verbal attacks began before they even opened last Thursday, the owners decided they were going to close. They put up a sign in the window that said closed for a day of kindness, and they wrote a respectful and honest comment about why on their Facebook page. Now, closing the doors for the staff, that was a gift. Their words to the staff, that was a blessing. The owners talked to the staff about how they should and should not be treated. They named their worth as human beings, as employees. They reminded them of their value and their competence. Then after cleaning the store, the owners treated them to an afternoon of food and rest. Offering a blessing, it reminds people of how life should be. Not what they've earned, not what they deserve, but the vision of a world in the kingdom of God. Sometimes that comes in the form of a letter. Sometimes that takes shutting down a restaurant when people act awful toward one another. Sixteen months ago, I sat down in my dining room early on a Sunday morning, and I pulled up the MIPC online worship page, 
It was one of our first weeks of being fully online, and I went through the worship and the response song after the sermon. It was one that I did not recognize called Your Labor is Not in Vain. The chorus is simple, and it is a blessing. I am with you. I am with you. For I have called you, called you by name. Your labor is not in vain. As I heard those words sung under the strings and the piano that morning, my eyes welled up with tears. The song held echoes of conversations I had been having with colleagues and friends and church members, people who were scared and unsure and exhausted. And this song spoke to me. These words and the music, they were a blessing to me that day and have been many days since. Part prayer, part reminder, part longing, part mystery. Vulnerable and honest, not demanding anything, not asking anything. As the months went on, I sent people a link to this song. I sent it to a friend who got divorced, who was worried about her kids, a blessing that the new home she was building would once again be filled with laughter and joy. I sent it to a friend who's a teacher, a blessing that though the place of his toil does not seem like a home, his labor was not unknown. This is a blessing offered to the world by musicians, touching my soul, a blessing I received and passed on. Sometimes sharing a blessing is that simple. In church, we practice both giving and receiving blessings. That is part of our life of faith. They are not magic words. They don't promise riches and health. Blessing someone with peace doesn't stop family fights in their tracks. Blessing someone with joy, it does not take away the sting of grief. Blessing someone with hope doesn't instantly lift the spirits of the person who cannot find a job or is feeling the weight of depression. What you do in a blessing is share God's love. You say in a blessing what you know and what you long for the promises that sustain you, and the world that God envisions. It can be complicated to bless people, because when we bless people, we are often giving them something that is not ours to give, and yet we are called to be blessers, because these words remind us of the presence of God, and they tie us together, and this reminder is important. We together are called to be the blessers, not blessing others from on high or a place of power, but in a way that is vulnerable, opening ourselves up to the needs and the hearts of others. What might that look like for you to do in your life, for us to do in our life together? Who do you know that needs to hear a blessing? Maybe it's a blessing for someone moving to a new home or apartment. May you sense God's spirit in this new home, filling you with comfort and peace. May you find joy in your days, enough nourishment at your table, rest at night. Maybe it's a nighttime blessing for a child. May your sleep give you what you need for what tomorrow holds. May you have the strength and resilience and kindness you need to thrive. May you know how much you are loved. Maybe a nonprofit organization that you or we partner with needs a blessing. In addition to the money that we send, maybe we take a time to write a blessing and mail it with our checks. May your staff know the deep impact of their work. 
Who do you know that needs a blessing? You can write it in your own words or use a poem or prayer or scripture. Offering a blessing is an incredible, intimate, life-giving moment. Giving others something that is not ours to give. Reminding each other that the work is not fruitless, that we are wonderfully, beautifully made. Think for a moment about what needs to be affirmed in life. If you can think of that, you are very close to a blessing. Look around, share what needs to be affirmed, and share it with one another. As you do so, may you see yourselves as wonderfully and beautifully made. May you find the courage to offer this world what it is that you have to give. May you find joy in each new day. And may you know the God who loves and cares for you as if God had nothing else to do. Amen.